Let's face it, the coronavirus pandemic has forced us all to change and adapt to this new world of social distancing and quarantine. For artists and performers, the change was profound. Closed venues, cancellations, and postponed performances meant an immediate halt to their way of life. Or so we thought. As days in self-isolation turned into weeks, Connecticut's creative sector has found new ways to make it work. This hour on Connecticut Conversations, we'll hear from some of these innovative artists and arts organizations. I'm Ray Hardman, and as you can see, I'm broadcasting from the comfort of my own home. It's almost become ubiquitous, right? The TV hosts broadcasting from home, bookshelves in the background, but this is how it is right now, and we're all adapting. Tonight, we're going to hear from some amazing people who are channeling their creative spirit in new and interesting ways. Let's get started. The creative mind behind Vintage Soul Productions in New Haven has come up with a really cool idea. It's a virtual theater festival called the Quick Quarantined Play Festival. Joining me now is Cherie Selim. She's a playwright, choreographer, director, and founder of Vintage Soul Productions. Welcome, Cherise. Hi, thank you for having me. Let's talk about the Quick Quarantine Play Festival. First, uh, for you, what was this festival all about? What were you trying to accomplish? So uh, I know a lot of other theater people like myself feel restless, uh, being behind closed doors, not being able to really go out, not being able to go to the theater and you know, use our acting muscles and our you know, playwriting and, and seeing how that would come about on stage. And so I decided that the only resource I had was the internet. So why not have actors and playwrights just come together and release theater online? And so that that's what we're doing. And um, it, it's become much bigger than what I expected. Lots of actors looking for things to do. How many actors and playwrights have been involved so far? So right now, uh, 46 actors. Um, and we've had to date 20, oh, 32 playwrights. Let's talk about the plays. Are they all, all COVID related? What are the guidelines? It's pre-COVID, during COVID, and post-COVID in the future. And it's that's pretty much the setting, but the, the playwrights don't have to make that be the entire theme of their pieces. So it's really just kind of showing humanity during these times. It's, it's the background, but it's not mm -hmm. the overall piece. How many plays have been submitted so far? So the way that part of the process works is no one knows what they're writing and so until we meet. So we actually start off on Tuesday with the Zoom meet and greet. The playwrights kind of get a feel for the actors. They meet each other for the first time. And on Wednesday, playwrights will be assigned three random actors. They have no idea who they're being assigned to. And then the actor is the muse. So they create their monologue specifically for them. So just taking little pieces of their life and information that the actors share with them. And then they just take it from there and create their own stuff. So they write it in one day and then they perform it in one day? Yep. The playwright has 24 mm. hours to write it and the actors have 24 hours to create. <laughs> Typically in traditional times, theater festivals are a good way to experiment with new works. It's also a chance to meet new people and forge new collaborations. I'm just curious, has that happened yet in your virtual festival? Yes. Um, we actually keep a page on, um, on our Facebook page for the actors and playwrights who have been involved in the process to stay connected. Um, but yes, they're, they're currently forming relationships now and talking about doing further works in the future. I was just thinking, you know, it, you've created, in essence, this time capsule of the, this whole experience of staying at home. Yeah, it, it does feel like a time capsule because these, uh, these stories that are, are, that are being created are being created in real time. So some are inspired by real life events and, you know, of course, most of them are fictional, but we have raw material to work with being in the situation. You were gracious enough to send along a video of one of the sub submissions to the, the, the play festival. Tell me about First Day Jitters. So First Day Jitters, um, the actor in that is uh, a Jackie Simone and she's a New Haven, Connecticut uh, actor. Matched her with uh, Matthew Everett, who's out in Minnesota. And that play is about when COVID is over and going back to the theater. 
and just this being stuck in between, should I go, should I not go? This fear, you know, this paralyzing fear. And then you see, if you look on the other side of a mirror, she has a Lysol container and the mask and the gloves. And theater is so touchy-feely, right? So then there's this, this fear of, should I leave the house, should I go? But I love theater, I need to be around people. And while COVID is over, there's still a fear. And so I think that's very realistic and that's what we may be, you know, facing in the future. Well, Sharice Selim, thank you so much for talking with me today. Uh, and what a cool concept, your, your play festival. Thank you so much. Now, let's watch some of First Day Jitters from the Quick Quarantine Play Festival. Theater is all the things that we're not supposed to do right now. Or weren't supposed to do back then. Last week. What if it's not safe? It hasn't been long enough. Gathering together as a community in the dark, in the same space, breathing the same air. Are they gonna be wearing masks? Am I not allowed to wear a mask because it doesn't go with my costume? They can't sit next to each other, can they? There has to be at least two seats between them. I mean, a full house will probably be a third of a house or a quarter of a house. Will we even enjoy it? And what about when somebody coughs? Somebody always coughs. What play could possibly be that important? Who would want to risk going outside and then back inside at a place that's not your home that you can't be sure is safe? We're trying to pretend that watching things play out on stage the way they used to be will make them normal again. Every play is a period piece. Coronavirus was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization back in early March. And just like here in the United States, people all over the world have been under stay-at-home orders ever since in an effort to curb the spread of the disease. The Hartford-based ensemble Cuatro Puntos has been reaching out and collaborating with musicians from around the world who are also staying at home. Joining me now is the artistic director of Cuatro Puntos, violist Kevin Bishop. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Of course. Kevin, we talked back in March and you stressed that the whole idea of self-isolation really goes against the basic principles of your ensemble. Yes. Um... That, that's definitely true, and it definitely took some time to find a new way forward, as I'm sure has been the case for basically all people everywhere, especially in the arts field. Because, I mean, the whole basis of Cuatro Puntos, I mean, our right in our mission statement is that we're dedicated to intercultural dialogue and universal access through music. So, um, you know, at first it was a little devastating to find that suddenly the very thing that is the whole essence of our organization, bringing people together from all around the world, uh, was suddenly the thing that we're not supposed to do. <laughs> since uh, since we first talked back in March, you've set up this cross-Atlantic quarantine sessions. Uh, tell me how this idea came about. Personally, I've had the opportunity throughout my life to um, go to all over the world to teach and to network with musicians and, you know, live different places and teach, um, meet really cool people. So it suddenly dawned on me with this new life of Zoom which is now um, apparently taking over everything, that we can now create these incredible opportunities to uh, bring people together from all over the world. And uh, we've had four of our 11 sessions so far, and we've had you know great success. We've had um, over 100 people at each one. Um, but throughout the series, we're bringing together various artists from around the world. We have people from South Africa, Iraq, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, India, Afghanistan, um india i think i said so you know they're broadcasting from their home country to 
you know, all anywhere. And we, of course, we have a lot of people in Connecticut who are watching, but we've had people in all sorts of countries. I don't even know exactly how they found out about it, but, you know, it's just been really special, some of the things that have been going on. So the video you're sharing with us is from one of these sessions, and it features the talents of Iraqi composer Amin Mokhtad. Tell, uh, tell me about him. Yeah, so Amin and I uh, met when we were both working on a project um, in Eastern Turkey on the Syrian border. We were working um, in a program there for a music program for mostly for refugee children who came over from Syria and Iraq into that region. And he's a, he's from Iraq. He's in Baghdad right now. He um, had a really incredible life. Um, he was in, he's from Mosul, Iraq, which was occupied by ISIS for several years in recent history. And he was there and he was trapped and he was making and composing music through all of that. And when I was there with him in Turkey, we were roommates and we would just stay up all night and he would tell me these mind blowing stories every night about his, you know, his time there and, and just these crazy things that were happening, yet he was composing and learning and making music. And as a result of that, the Quattropuntos Ensemble just recently did an album with him of music, all the music that he composed while he was in hiding in Mosul. Um, and during that time, I mean, they came in, destroyed all of his instruments. He had to go on the run. Uh, it's really crazy, but he composed this huge breadth of music of which we recorded a large majority of it uh, with him. Well, Kevin Bishop, thank you so much and good luck with your series moving forward. Thank you so much. appreciate it. All right, here it is from The Curve by Amin Mukdad, a virtual performance by Mukdad and members of Cuatro Puntos.
Artists and performers are a big part of the so-called gig economy. Take, for instance, my next guest, Carolyn Payne. She's a dancer, actor, and comic. During normal times, she's busy performing, auditioning, and giving dance lessons, but self-isolation changed all that, at least at first. Carolyn joins me now. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, thanks for having me. So you got busy right away in self-isolation with this beautiful video of dancers performing in isolation. And since then, you've been doing all sorts of fun, creative things. Tell me about some of those. Yeah, I mean, I think as an artist, it's really hard to sit still. You're just not used to that. So uh, I've done, I've, I've tried to do art and have fun. Um, I rallied my neighborhood into doing a musical. Uh, we did One Day More from Les Mis, and uh, that was really, really fun. Um, obviously, like, my neighborhood is not filled with professional performers, but it was pretty awesome how many people wanted to participate and submitted videos of themselves singing and some in costume. So, Carolyn, what was your approach to, to this crazy time we're all experiencing? Because a lot of people kind of you know, went into shelter and you you kind of took the opposite approach to, and, and you did this early on. Explain what, what your thought process was. Well, I think that uh, as an artist, you kind of have this great platform. You can use your voice and use your talent and use what you're feeling to really create, create something. And uh, for me as a performer, I mean, I, I'm kind of a comedian at heart and uh, that, that sense of making people smile is something that I think we all need right now. And so any, any art that I'm creating, I just kind of want to make people feel good. And, uh, and it helps me, too, to kind of cope and to make people smile and uh, brighten their day a little and give them something to look at other than the news. Uh, Carolyn, tell me, what, what have you learned about yourself and, and others during this time? <laughs> um, I learned that I really don't necessarily like being... Still, I don't think any of us like being home this much. I always thought of myself as a homebody. I always joke that, you know, I'll be on the road doing shows and out auditioning and filming, and uh, but that my favorite thing was being home on my couch with my cat. Uh, it turns out that is not my favorite thing <laughs> at all. Carolyn, tell us about the video that we're about to see. It's it's really striking, and it's you with a violinist. Or violist. Is it, is it a violist or a violinist? Uh, yeah, so uh, Gary and I met a couple years ago, and um, he is just a beautiful musician. He he just he plays from the heart, and uh, he had been posting online, uh, just kind of playing little snippets of different violin pieces, sort of expressing his feelings through his instrument. And uh, we got this idea. We'd always talked about collaborating, and it's hard when you are busy lives, busy artists, and. Uh, this just felt like such an amazing time to do that. So he recorded um, one of the Telemann concertos and uh, I choreographed a short piece um, slash some like improv as well. And uh, so we combined uh, our talents to create this video that the Telemann concerto is called Fantasia. So we call it Fantasia in Quarantine. Well, Carolyn Payne, thank you so much for catching us up on all the crazy things you're doing. And let's have a, let's have a look at the video. For many artists, stay-at-home orders dealt a serious blow to their livelihood. But a group of volunteers from New Haven have created a website that not only brings together the Elm City's artistic community, but also pays them for their services. It's called AtHomeInNewHaven.com. Joining me now are three organizers of the website, Anthony Allen, 
Paul Brian Hudson and Hope Chavez. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for having me. Here. Hope, let me start with you. First, tell us how this website works. Right now, the website acts as a virtual stage. It's a platform. So there's a way for folks who want to volunteer with us to sign up and show interest. There's also a way for folks who want to be presenters, whether that's teaching a class in bread making or performing as a musician, um, to express interest in being a presenter. Um, and then when we have a schedule, it's really seamless. You can scroll through all the events that are upcoming, register for an event for either $5 or free with the code that we have online. Um, and then you can join us from the comfort of your own home in all of the virtual programming that we offer. That is so cool. Anthony, how did this idea come about? This really was a product of a couple things. Um, the, the first being just understanding and, and having an appreciation for all the different things that were already happening around New Haven, all the artists that were bringing their work into virtual spaces, all of the other organizations and individuals that were being really creative and starting to use virtual spaces in, in new ways. And also uh, coming out of a virtual conference that I participated in back in, I guess that would have been late March. It's the Skull World Forum, and normally it happens in person in Oxford. You know, it's not an easy thing to get to. And because of coronavirus, they had to take the whole thing online. And they did so in a way that was distributed, that used a variety of different formats, and that allowed thousands of new people to participate in what they were doing. And those two things sort of came together with this desire to rekindle some of the things that I, for one, was feeling like I'd lost to this crisis, the ability to connect with other people in my city, you know, to spontaneously bump into one another, to be inspired together, all of that. And so that all came together and, and coalesced into the beginning of the idea for At Home in New Haven. Paul, we know how the artistic community was impacted by the pandemic, especially financially, was making sure that artists got paid a big part of the original concept. Yeah, I think that's pretty core to the, to the concept overall. Um, in the early phases of planning and kind of dreaming this thing up, we, um, we kind of centered the needs and uh, the experiences of artists here in our community. Um, a thing that we understand is that artists are often uh, among the most vulnerable and vulnerable communities and are often uh, underrepresented and unreached um, in aid efforts and um, even government assistance. So when we, when we sort of imagine what it would look like to, to create a platform like this, uh, we prioritize the way it would impact and, and contribute to the creative economy here in New Haven. What about artists who, who want to participate in at home in newhaven.com but they don't or they can't afford uh, the equipment for the Zoom meeting. So uh, one of the other things that we worked on is uh, we raised funds to, uh, to purchase a, a recording package. Um, so it's a basic home studio setup that we've been circulating with the community uh, to artists and presenters who don't have the resources or the equipment necessary to, to present um, high quality audio, video, and presentation. Um, so that looks like uh, one of the team members dropping the, the package off um, at, on the porch, um, on a phone call or a Zoom, walking folks through how to set that thing up. Um, and uh, picking it up when the presentation is done, cleaning it off and off to the next. Absolutely, I can totally understand that. Hope you mentioned at the beginning that you went for a week and now you're taking a little bit of time right now to reassess. What are some of the take backs from the first week for you? Well, there's so many. Um, there's some that are just really practical on the tech side about how can we make these sessions have the outcomes that we want. So we, um, with everyone who was a presenter, um, the weekend before that we started, we did these uh, gatherings for the presenters to say, like, what is it you want folks to walk away feeling? What is it you want folks to learn, right? And so I think we're still finding moments um, from the first week where that intention didn't quite always manifest fully because of some of the technical things that we were learning um, in the space. Um, but we also are learning that there is there actually is a community here in New Haven who wants to be part of receiving this, right? Like we had it, we had an impulse, there was a gut, Anthony had this idea, but we really saw that there was energy around it in the community um, and they're hungry for more, I think. Real quick, Paul, before, before I let you, uh, let you go, um, what's the future looking like? Do you see this website living on past uh, a post-pandemic world? I think it's a really cool moment in history where we can 
together, sort of reimagine what uh, performance spaces and workshopping and, and facilitating looks like. Um, we're as a as a team. I think we're excited about keeping New ha- at home in New Haven going for as long as it makes sense. Great. We'll hope. Anthony, Paul, thank you so much for your time today, and best of luck with AtHomeInNewHaven.com. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Cheers. on. The pandemic has been hard on everyone, especially kids. Back in early March, middle and high school students were putting the finishing touches on their spring musicals and concerts, and that all went away. As a former high school choir and musical nerd, I can tell you it's devastating. These events are not only important to them artistically, they are also a huge part of their social life. Tucked away in Torrington, Connecticut, is the internationally acclaimed children's choir, Chorus Angelicus, which next year celebrates their 30th anniversary. Joining me now is the artistic director of Chorus Angelicus, Gabriel Lufal. Hi, Gabriel. Hi, Ray. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Before we get into what you and the kids have been doing in the last two months, let me ask you, how important is this choir to these kids? It's a major part of their lives, especially my group. Uh, Chorus Angelicus is a choir school divided into five different groups. They start when they are very young, at an early age, when they are toddlers, and uh, they move up the ladder. So there are, they are two training choirs, which we call the Angels in Training and the Advanced Angels in Training. Then there's the Junior Choir, which roughly is you know late elementary school and through middle school. And then there is my group, the Senior Choir, which is pretty much, I would say, talented middle school kids and all through high school until they graduate. And this is important to them socially as well, because, you know, you have I know you have a, a, a place of retreats and and you perform outside of Connecticut all over the place. So this is an important social hey. connection for for these middle and high school kids as well. Right. This activity is very involved. We rehearsed we rehearse once, uh, twice a week, which is different from you know some groups that just meet once a week. And uh, when it's time to sing the concerts, we add rehearsals, usually two more rehearsals. So Chorus Angelicus for them is really a very involved activity. Technology has just not caught up with choir rehearsals. There's just no way technically that everyone in real time can sing together, hear themselves, and discuss issues of blend and intonation. It's a different type of experience. Uh, you are exactly right. There is no way to uh, to find a substitute for uh, choral rehearsals. Uh, Zoom rehearsals are really uh, still um, lecture style presentations where you as a teacher can talk to them. You can sing um, if you're you know, if you get savvy with the application, you can do a lot of call and response, which ends up being extremely useful. I also train the kids to be their own teachers. So I give them, I give them assignments um, and, you know, and I get them to prepare uh, different passages of different pieces of music to be ready to teach them to their peers. Well, Gabby, speaking of virtual performances, you brought along a beautiful virtual performance of, uh, of Chorus Angelicus singing Non Nobis Domine. Why did you choose that work? Uh, well, Non Nobis Domine, you know, it's, um, it's the incipit or the first words of a conventional uh, Christian song that has been around for centuries. Um, this specific one that we sing with Chorus Angelicus, it's actually a wonderful round. It's like a, you know, like a canon, like row, row, row your boat or yeah. Frere Jacques. So the principle is very simple. It's just the same melody repeated uh, at different times in a fuguing way, like fugue, following each other. And I think the, the success of this piece is that it's a wonderful round at the unison first, actually at the fourth first, and then at the unison. So with the same melody, you create this semblance of an incredible you know, polyphonic architectural moment. All right, Gabby, thank you so much. And here is that virtual performance of Non Nobis Domine.
As we were putting together this show, we thought it would be fun to ask an artist to sum up this whole experience of art, resiliency, and coronavirus with a work of art that we could present on this program. So we hit up Hartford-based artist Corey Payne to do the honors. He turned on his iPhone and captured the whole process for us, and Corey joins us right now. Corey, first, uh, how are you holding up these days? How you doing? I'm doing good. I've been painting a lot now that we've been inside a lot and everything, um, and just trying to I don't know, keep, keep up with what I usually would be doing. Did the circumstances of the pandemic ex inspire you at all to uh, create more art? Yeah, I mean, I, I created a piece just just by based on what I was feeling, just being kind of inside and seeing other people being, I don't know, kind of like I felt like people were being becoming trapped in bubbles and just kind of living this whole different type of world. So I wanted to do something that just kind of reflected how I was feeling about that or how maybe I, other people around me were feeling and I don't know, do something that represented the time. Absolutely. Corey, tell us a little bit about the jigsaw puzzles. I know you're kind of on a jigsaw jag right now. Yeah. Um, so I did this painting based on like the whole coronavirus kind of thing going on. And I tried to make it kind of serious and have some things that are like going on with the world right now. And then also make it kind of funny, try to tie a little bit of everything in there. And then I made it into a puzzle because I thought that would be pretty fitting just for right now while, while people having a lot of time on their hands and people seem to be into doing puzzles and kind of creative things while they're stuck inside. That's so awesome. I, I haven't touched a puzzle in years and, and already my family and I have gone through two puzzles during during this yep. time. That's, <laughs> that's so awesome. Corey, what are you hearing from others in your artist community about how, how they're coping? I, a lot of my friends, they've been trying to do a lot of the same things they've been doing, maybe just like working on their own things or taking the time to do things that they didn't have the time to do before. So there's that's one good thing about it. And I mean, I know for me personally, I like how the world has just slowed down a little bit. I know I had like a lot of stuff on my plate yeah. before this was going on. And just to have everything slow down and have time to kind of focus on your own things or just catch up on stuff, it, it's kind of nice. But at the same time, I'm ready to for this to be over and to get back out there, especially with the summer coming up, like having being out there doing some murals and I don't know, painting at festivals or all that kind of stuff. You talked about it a little bit, but tell me more about the finished product and how long did it take? So I did it really quick. I tried to do it within an hour. I, I tried to do something that was kind of colorful and along the same theme of what I, the other painting I just had done before that. And it's almost like an offshoot of that. And uh, I guess like a sequel, you know? What was on your mind as you were doing this, uh, as you were doing this work, as you were putting paintbrush to canvas, what were you thinking about? I was, I was just trying to think about how everyone was feeling around like this time. And I don't know, maybe like, I know a lot of people are just maybe kind of down and like ready for all this to be over and get back to normal life. So I was trying to just, have an idea where it represents how people are feeling, but also like a feeling of hope towards like whatever is new to come and within this new world that we're going to be living in after all this is over. Well, Corey, the, the painting is just really beautiful, very fitting. I can't wait to see it in person soon. And I, I just want to thank you so much for talking with us today and really all the best. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's not just young innovators that are finding creative ways to engage their audience and supporters during the pandemic. Even Connecticut's long-established traditional institutions are getting in on the act. Take, for instance, Goodspeed Musicals in East Haddam. They've embraced this new reality with a number of online offerings. Joining me now is the producer of Goodspeed Musicals, Donna Lynn Hilton. Donna, welcome. Thank you for having me, Ray. So you've been busy. Tell, tell us about the slate of online programs you've been working on. 
We have been busy. It's hard to imagine that not producing shows would be more work than producing shows, but that seems to be what's going on down here in East Haddam. Um, we have a number of online initiatives that we've rolled out um, since early April. I think the one that's probably most interesting to our audience uh, is Great Speed, which is a look back at some of our biggest hits over the years. Uh, we do that every Tuesday night at seven o'clock. We show uh, video clips from the B-roll of the productions, and I have as my guest, one of the artists, if not more of the artists who helped us create that work. And uh, it's turning out to be uh, something that our audience is really looking forward to. We have close to 200 people sign in every Tuesday night. It's a rolling group of people. We haven't seen the same people sign in every week. Um, And it's been really um, helpful, I think, for for our staff and for our artists and for our audience to be able to remember and hold on to uh, what we are all about, and to, to, it helps oh, reinforce sure, our determination sure. to come back strong when we're able to. People might not realize that since Goodspeed has been around in the early 60s, I guess, you've produced hundreds of musicals and a lot of world premieres. Tell me about some of the musicals that you're going to feature in Great Speed. So, uh, so far we have featured our, our beautiful production, Fiddle Around the Roof, uh, 1776. Uh, this coming week we're going to feature Showboat, which was a beautiful 2011 revival. Um, Many people couldn't get tickets to that revival at the time, so I hope that people will tune in and get a peep at the show. Um, And we're gonna be looking back at some of our, the new work that we developed, um, Holiday Inn being a perfect example of of one of the newest works that have come off our stage, Chasing Rainbows, another new musical that I know will eventually make it to New York that that, uh, we're gonna take a look back at as well. So we have a, a long catalog in, 56 years, 56 years, I believe now, 56 years of producing new work. I mean, producing work. We have a long, a long archive to dig back into. Fantastic. Let's go back to at the home office. Is that the name of it? In the home office. In the home office. People are getting a glimpse into the creative process that they wouldn't, under normal circumstances, they wouldn't have access to. Is that right? That is correct. You know, part of my job and part of the job of others on our artistic staff is to constantly stay in touch with writers who are developing important new work. Um, and that's just, that's a constant, ongoing, evolving conversation. What are they developing? Uh, what is the sound of the show? What has been the development of the show thus far? How can Good Speed help? And so what this this event is giving us the opportunity to do is to really showcase some pieces that we are really interested in but haven't figured out yet where we might be able to program them if we can program them. Donna, how hard was it for you and the staff to transition from a a live performance uh, that you're so good at to this, uh, this online uh, experience that we're having. Was there a learning curve there? There was a huge learning curve. You know, first it, there was there was some mourning that we had to do. I have a friend who speaks that way about things like this that happen in our lives. We, you know, we wanted to produce six shows this year and we're clearly not going to be able to. And so it took us a couple of weeks to say, this is right. our new reality. We have to stop fighting this. We have to get serious and figure out how we're going to remain engaged with our audience. Um, And after that, it has been a tremendous learning curve, but we spent a week deep diving into how we were gonna manage all this process and and just went after it because we had to, we have no option. And we cannot lose contact with our audience during this time. We, we, We want them to remember that we are here for them, that we matter to them, and we're gonna be here when we get through this. Um, so it was hard and we're still struggling. We had a our great speed event last night. We had a terrible um, interference with our video. Um, we're looking at other platforms today. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but yeah, it's been hard. It's been hard, yeah. but we have no choice. Donna, you brought along a video from one of your recent in the home office episodes and it's a musical performance. Tell me about it. It's a beautiful musical performance. Um, Passing Through was the summer production at the Terrace last year. Beautiful new musical, first production. Goodspeed audiences were the very first in the world to see this piece. Uh, It had been developed through our Johnny Mercer Writers Colony and our Festival of New Musicals. And when all of this 
COVID-19 crisis hit the theater community, the authors of that piece wanted to do something for the Actors Fund. And working with August Eric Smoen, the um, arranger, the music arranger of the piece, the entire company of the show, Brett Ryback and Eric Ulloa, the writers, put together this incredible um, song of of uh, from from passing through and it is absolutely it is a perfect example of how well we can create online content when we we're not quite sure what we're doing um, and it's a really moving beautiful performance Some folks cut and run if they're not ahead And they leave behind a trail of broken hearts But if there's one thing that I've learned It's nothing's over till you're dead At the end of the road is where the real journey starts And when I die, there'll be nothing for to cry When I'm gone, no reason to be blue There'll be nothing left behind And nothing left to do as I go passing through I want to do it all as I go passing through Have you heard the story of the walking man And his trek of over 1,500 miles There's dance walking and days walking, high walking and craze walking, walking when you're lost inside a dream. Sing it, boy. There's beauty and there's bliss walking, there's man, I gotta piss walking, and walking where you simply stand and scream. There's burn walking and pain walking, and I might go insane walking when every bone and joint wants to explode. But when I can't take more walking, there's fury, hang more walking to keep me walking further down the road. And when I die, there'll be nothing for to cry. When I'm gone, no reason to be blue. There'll be nothing left behind and nothing left to do. I'm going to do it all as I go passing through. I want to do it all as I go passing through. Sounds like a chump. Obsessed with Forrest Gump. Or maybe there's something that he knows. I've still got unwalked miles left to go And many a revelation to behold With every step I take I learn how much I still don't know New questions to be answered New stories to be told And when I die I want nothing for to cry When I'm gone no reason to be blue I want nothing left behind And nothing left to do I'm gonna do it all as I go passing through
nothing left to do. I'm gonna do it all as I go past through. I'm gonna do it all as I go past through. We've heard the stories of some amazing artists tonight, and we've touched on it a little bit, but there's no way around the fact that the pandemic hit the creative sector hard. According to the arts advocacy group Americans for the Arts, arts and culture organizations in Connecticut have lost over $14.5 million so far in admission and non-admission revenue. Joining me now is Elizabeth Shapiro. She's the director of the Connecticut Office of the Arts, part of the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. Elizabeth, that $14 million number is staggering. What else can you tell us about how arts organizations are faring during this difficult time? The number is definitely staggering and it's likely to grow. So that's one thing we know. But at the same time, we're seeing parallel stories of response and hope in the industry. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and that's one of the most wonderful things about the creative industry. Um, we know that orchestras and theaters and symphonies are really suffering. They're gonna be among the last to be able to reopen in a way that is actually fiscally prudent. Um, we know places like the Eugene O'Neill Theater um, in Waterford has canceled their entire 2020 season. They employ over 380 contract artists alone, not to mention their staff. All of their events are being moved online. Um, Long Wharf, Wharf Theater in New Haven, same situation. The season is canceled. They've had to cancel their big fundraiser. And they're struggling to pivot and find a way to monetize their online um, services. Some of the stuff that's coming out is just amazing, but it's really challenging to know how to make money from it. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing this incredible creative response by organizations and artists. Um, one of the programs that I just heard of recently is a program, a project called Music Heals Us, which is out of a Guilford-based nonprofit. And it's a nonprofit that we actually funded through the Office of the Arts last year. Um, but they are bringing virtual com concerts to hospitalized COVID-19 patients across the country and their program has been featured in the New York Times and CNN. And um, what we're seeing is just this renaissance of creative responses to the pandemic that is definitely going to affect the way the arts move forward in a post-pandemic world. Liz, I think one of the things that we saw early on was this sense of dread that the arts weren't gonna be relevant during this time. But I think one of the things that's really given me hope personally is that even though, uh, is how important the arts seem to be right now, is that something that, that you're seeing and hearing as well? Oh, absolutely. I, I think the arts are maybe the sector that is most helping people move from this crisis with grace, retaining hope, and, and wholeness for people. Um, there's data to suggest that arts help with mental um, health, with contact isolation, and Americans for the Arts and lots of other national arts organizations are undertaking all kinds of, of studies right now to actually look at that data. But if you wanna see a national example, all you have to do is tune into any of the major networks um, across the United States. You're gonna be seeing professional performers performing from their homes. Um, they're raising money for charity. People are tuning in by the millions to watch these. I mean, Disney, Disney has had two family sing-along nights to date. Um, I think, oh, and I love this, Apple, the Apple company, if you've seen the Apple company's uh, commercials, it's all about artists and then the message is creativity. So artists are, I think, are really building the bridge and, and crossing it, leading others to cross it that are gonna, that is gonna run from the pre-COVID world to whatever comes next in this post-pandemic world. Another thing that brings me hope is something that you've mentioned before, is that these, uh, these arts organizations, these cultural organizations, all have creative minds working there that are also finding and can find creative solutions to, to the, these problems. We're so excited right now to see the place that artists and arts organizations are, are 
be, you know, what the, where they are stepping up to the plate in the world today. I think one of the things that I've seen in national conversations and in conversations in Connecticut is around the role that artists and creatives are going to take in our planning for what is to come next. And, and that's a conversation that the Connecticut Office of the Arts has been having with the Tremaine Foundation, which is a national foundation, but based in Connecticut. Um, organizations like Sustainable CT, they're all really interested in solving problems. And so what we're having conversations about is how artists are uniquely positioned to be problem solvers, which is something I think is, is not the normal way we look at the creative sector. But in fact, if we take um, artists and creatives and, and embed them into our town councils and our municipalities and planning and in rethinking what this future is gonna look like, I think we're gonna really be in a much stronger place. And in fact, um, there is the first convening of a task force to think about how um, the creative economy will help Connecticut's entire economy moving forward. Well, Elizabeth Shapiro, thank you so much for shedding some light on what these arts and cultural organizations are, are up against right now. My absolute pleasure. Anything I can do, um, we are there to help artists and to help all the people in Connecticut who love the arts. Um, and so we're there for you. Thanks to Elizabeth Shapiro, Director of the Connecticut Office of the Arts. A big thank you to all of our guests and to you for watching Connecticut Conversations. Let's end today with one more group of inspirational artists. Amara Mbike is music director of an undergraduate choir at Yale that focuses on songs of the African diaspora. It's called Shades of Yale. She shared this video from the Shades of Yale virtual spring concert. Here's their medley of Amen and We Shall Overcome, featuring current and alumni members of the group. Have a great night, and please stay safe. Mm.